It's my great pleasure to announce the next speaker. With us is Roger Dingeldein from the Tor Project, who is one of the designers of Tor, the Onion Router, and he'll give a brief overview of what Tor is, does, and its shortcomings and what will need to be done next. And the floor is yours. Okay. Hi, I'm Roger Dingeldein, and I'm the Tor project leader and one of the main developers. And uh, I'm going to try to tell you a little bit about uh, how Tor works right now. Uh, how many people were at Stephen's talk in the last session? Uh, OK, great. So quite a few hands. Uh, so there are a lot of different things I want to talk about today. I'm going to try to give you a lot of different ideas. And hopefully, they'll sink in over the next hour and over the next day. And uh, hopefully, some of you will come up to me tomorrow and say, I solved one of your problems. So I'll, I'll try to give you as many open problems as I can. And we'll go from there. So there are a lot of different things to talk about. Uh, I'll talk a little bit about uh, the goals of what we're trying to do with blocking resistance and the assumptions and threat model that we have in mind, and uh, what Tor offers now, what we need to fix, and all of the other problems that show up that uh, we don't have good answers to yet. OK, so the big picture for Tor. We're an anonymity network, and we let people browse the web or instant message uh, without certain attackers being able to learn what's going on. Uh, we're the, we come with uh, freely available open source software. Uh, there aren't any patents. Uh, you can do whatever you want to with it. Sell it, change it, give it away. Uh, it comes with a full specification and full documentation. Uh, we're one of the very few projects out there that actually uh, give you an RFC style specification of this is how you build your own Tor client and server. And two different research groups have uh, produced their own compatible versions. Uh, the European Union Prime project picked uh, Tor as their anonymity layer. So they decided that was the most flexible, the most scalable, the most documented system available. Uh, we've got some number of users. It's an anonymity network, so it's a bit hard to count them exactly. Uh, so we're guessing maybe a few hundred thousand. Uh, and then PC World Magazine picked us as number 40 of the top 100 products last year. Uh, we beat out Wikipedia. We beat out the iPod. Uh, who knows? So one of the really fun parts about working on Tor is that there are so many different groups who need uh, the security properties that it offers. Uh, we talk to uh, ordinary private citizens, and we describe it as a privacy system. We, we talk to uh, businesses and corporations, and we say it's communication security. It's network security. Obviously, you need that. You might not need privacy, but you need communication security. And then we talk to governments, and they don't need privacy. They don't really need network security. But boy, do they need traffic analysis resistant communication networks. So the fun part about all of this is to try to figure out how to phrase it for all the different users so that we can bring them all into the same group. Because we need military, uh, dissidents, people in China, uh, law enforcement, uh, Google, Walmart. We need all of these people in the same group so that they can blend together. Uh, otherwise, everybody would know that uh, this is the anonymity network that the CCC runs and the CCC uses, and I wonder who is coming out of it. Obviously, it's somebody from the CCC. So the goal is to bring a lot of different groups together so you have no idea what's actually coming out of the network. OK, so how do you build an anonymity system in the very simple way? The basic idea is you put a big computer somewhere, and it relays a lot of traffic. A bunch of people show up. We've got a lot of Alice's there on the left side. They all show up to the big computer, and they say, I want Indie Media. I want CNN. I want Voice of America. And then it fetches the websites and gives them back. And that's great. There are a lot of systems out there that work like that. The problem is the big central point of failure. You can uh, bribe the janitor, get a job as the janitor, threaten the CEO, send a nice guy named Guido, uh, send a subpoena. There are so many different ways to attack a central uh, point like that. So our goal is we want to distribute the trust. We want to make it so that uh, the connection goes over several different relays, and no single relay knows about both Alice and Bob. So in this case, if the first guy is bad, he knows that Alice is using the system, but he doesn't know who Alice is talking to. And if the last guy is bad, 
he knows that somebody is talking to Bob, but he doesn't know who's talking to Bob. So that's the, the crash course in Tor, and I'll answer a few more questions later on about it, um, and hopefully that'll get you enough to, to start moving. So the way that we actually do this is we build what are called tunneled connections through that. So the, Alice establishes a key with R1, and then she tunnels from there to R2 and establishes a new key, and from there to R3, and then she can talk to uh, various Bobs, maybe CNN, Voice of America, Indie Media, something like that. And the idea is that uh, R1 knows Alice is talking, but because of the encryption, he can't figure out what Alice is saying or, or who she's talking to. So far, so good? Okay. So what I'm talking about here is blocking resistance. Uh, let's say you're a Tor user in China. We have uh, quite a few users in China. I think they're either the number two or the number three country in terms of Tor users. There are maybe 30,000 people uh, running Tor clients in China right now. And it works. They use it. They're happy. Uh, but if China wanted to block it, it wouldn't be that hard to do. You can block the directory authorities. I'll tell you later on what those are. You can grab the whole list of all the 800 Tor servers out there, and you can block all of them. Or you can look at the network fingerprint and say, that looks like a Tor handshake. I'm going to block that connection right now. So I'm going to try to fix some of this uh, today. So what we're trying to do here is we want to attract a whole lot of different relay addresses. I'll tell you more about what that means later. We need to normalize Tor's network fingerprint, make it so that when somebody is making a Tor connection, you can't say, hey, look, that's Tor. Um, we need to solve the discovery problem. How do you actually figure out what you can connect to, what is available that China hasn't blocked yet? Um, and we really don't want to screw up our anonymity properties while we're doing this. And that makes it really hard because we don't really understand how anonymity works right now. So when we add even more complex pieces to it, uh, hard to say what will mess up. So that makes it one of the big open problems. OK, so threat model, what are we trying to deal with here? Uh, first of all, we want to try to defend against a really strong attacker. This is how all the academic designs work and how all good security designs work. We want to say, even if you're really strong, we still defend against you because in, in reality, in practice, uh, attackers tend to be stronger than we expect them to be. Um, and we also uh, are able to defend against weaker attackers. I was talking to uh, an American corporation recently, and they have a new network policy. Thou shalt not use Tor on our network. And uh, maybe that's bad for their security or their privacy or their users. Uh, that's up to them. But I'd like to be able to handle attackers like that as well. So we've got a lot of different users in mind, um, people in all the various countries that Reporters Without Borders has declared are internet black holes, uh, whistleblowers in corporate networks. Uh, who knows what's going to happen next? We'd like to solve all of that. Uh, OK, so what's the attacker trying to do here? One of the, the most challenging parts of this is trying to figure out what problem we should actually solve. I hear from a lot of different people who say, I'm going to solve the China problem, and this is what I think the China problem is. And when you talk to people in China, that's not the problem they have at all. So one of the big uh, questions here is, how do we actually figure out what we need to solve? So the first piece is, what's the attacker trying to do? Uh, he's trying to restrict the flow of information, lots of different types. Maybe it's embarrassing information. Uh, something happened in our country, and we don't want, the, we don't want to let the world know about it. Uh, maybe it's uh, opposition. Somebody is trying to organize some uh, dissidents or something like that. Um, and maybe we don't actually need to stop that flow of information. We just need to give people the impression that we're doing it. And then they won't speak, uh, even if they could speak. Complete blocking is not a goal. Um, it's not even necessary. We don't have to stop everybody from communicating. We just have to stop most people, the, the easy ones, the ones that don't care that much. Um, and similarly, we don't have to stop every circumvention tool. We don't have to make sure that every single possible way to get out of China is stopped. We just have to stop the ones that are uh, really popular and effective the ones that actually work, and the ones that are highly visible, the ones that uh, write a lot of media articles saying, I've just built a tool and my tool is going to take over democracy all around the world. Um, they may not work, that doesn't matter. The, the goal of, the, 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 goal of the, the censors is to say, uh, all of these things that you've read in the news, they're not true. We take care of that. We keep you safe. 
Another big assumption, uh, if you're just reading news in China, maybe you connect to some website that they forgot to censor, they're not going to do anything to you. The, the worst that happens when you go to a, a website you should not have gone to and read it is they say, oops, and then they add it to the list of websites that they censor. They don't go hunt you down and kill you just because you read the wrong thing. Uh, on the other hand, if you're publishing things, if you're organizing, if you're describing new information, uh, then they get very upset. So one of the big assumptions we make is you're allowed to use the internet and they won't get that angry as long as you're not uh, providing new information, as long as you're not producing and distributing information. Uh, and then another big assumption, uh, the people who are doing the censoring have a lot of economic and political and social incentives not to block the whole internet. Um, this is certainly true in China, where their, their economics are going to be based on communicating and working with the rest of the world. It's not necessarily true in a bunch of the, the former Soviet Union states. Uh, maybe you're just screwed there. Uh, we can't solve that problem at the same time as other problems. Um, and also, we should keep in mind, they don't mind collateral damage. If there's a website somewhere that they really want to make it go away, and there are 15,000 other websites on that same computer, so be it. Let's block them all. So we can't have everything, but we're at least starting with some assumptions that help us figure out what to solve. There are three big attacks that we've been seeing from these various sensors from a lot of different countries. One of the big ones is they have a list of IP addresses, and if they see any packets going to those IP addresses, they drop those packets on the floor. Another big one is keyword searching. Um, they look at all the different TCP packets that are going through, and if they see a certain word in the TCP packet, then they either drop that packet on the floor or they send resets in both directions to make things shut down. There are a lot of different approaches for that. But the second big idea is they look for little strings in the TCP packets. It's a very simple attack. And then the third one is they intercept DNS requests and they give back garbage or they point you at a website saying, are you really sure you want to look at that page because you're an immoral person? Um, so there are a lot of different uh, approaches that they use there. Okay, so what are we trying to design against? Uh, the firewall that they have uh, can't spend that much, inf that much time looking at every single connection. It can't look at something and say, was that a valid public key interaction and did they sign it correctly and so on. Uh, it can do a little bit of operations, but it sure can't do uh, a lot of computation for every single person who is looking at some website. Uh, so fortunately, we don't need full steganography. Uh, we can chat about that more afterwards also. Um, and there's probably going to be a time lag between uh, somebody in Thailand learning how to censor something and somebody in China learning how to censor something. They don't immediately talk to each other. Uh, probably the best way that they will communicate that to each other is through American corporations. Cisco is going to say, hey, I learned how to oppress your citizens better. I'm going to sell that to all these different countries that want to buy it. Uh, the other side of that is uh, the insider threat is probably not a worry at the beginning because they don't even know that we exist. Uh, once we become either popular and effective or uh, have a lot of press, then they'll start to care. Before that, it doesn't matter. Another critical thing to keep in mind, uh, the censorship is different even inside various countries. The directive that China has, as far as I can tell, is they tell all the different ISPs, don't embarrass us. That's the whole summary. And then each ISP has to figure out what that means and figure out which pages they shouldn't let people do and, and things like that. So it's going to be different depending on which province you're in and what time of day and so on. Um, and then another assumption, attackers can go to various countries and companies and, and, and list their help. They can go to Yahoo or Cisco or Google or who knows and say, hey, can you, uh, can you let us know who that person is because uh, they're our citizen and we'd like to uh, uh, help them. So uh, <laughs> there are a lot of different approaches we need to keep in mind for that also. And I don't like this assumption, but I have to make it at this point. Uh, assume the users are not being attacked by their hardware and software. Uh, I was chatting with a couple of people from an East Asian communist country a little while ago, and they told me some pretty bad stories. They said, uh, people walk into our house and they answer our Skype calls. There's a guy across the street with a parabolic microphone listening to everything I say. When I walk out of the house, they steal my laptop and they install new things on it, and then they put it back. I can't solve that. Um, I'd like to be able to, but one impossible problem at a time.
Um, and then also assume the users can actually get a good copy of Tor. Uh, if they go to the Tor website and China gives them a Tor website and China gives them a new program called Tor, or maybe it's uh, China Tor or whatever they're going to call it, uh, I can't solve that one either. But maybe PGP signatures and stuff like that will be a good start. Okay, so what does Tor offer now? What do we have that we're working with? Uh, Tor has three big anonymity properties. The first one is somebody watching you locally can't figure out what websites you're going to, and they can't decide whether you're allowed to do that. This is clearly useful for blocking resistance. The second one is no single server in the Tor network can figure out both you and where you're going. So they're not able to say, hey, the, uh, the, the person over there who works at this factory in China, they've been going to this website. And that means that they probably won't try to just sign up a lot of Tor servers to figure it out. We can talk more about that attack also. And then the third one is the destination can't figure out where you're coming from. Um, you'll notice when you go to Google in various countries, it gives you different languages and even different results. Imagine if China went to Google and said, hey, can you guys not, not give certain answers? Can you do the censoring for us when somebody's coming from China? Um, I think they do that already to some extent. Um, if people are going through Tor, then Google has no idea what country they're coming from. It can't treat them specially. It can't say, you're coming from China, you can't have this page. So these are the three big properties that we get uh, so far with Tor. Uh, another big piece, we have what are called directory authorities. We know how to do uh, simple network discovery. There's a big list of all the Tor servers. It's signed by uh, five central servers, and the, the keys for those central servers uh, come with the source code, come with Tor. So you can go anywhere, you can get a directory, and you say, oh good, I'm using the real Tor network. I'm using the same Tor network that everybody else is using. And this information is cached all around the network. So um, it's a trust bottleneck. There are only five directory authorities, but it's not an actual bandwidth bottleneck. So far, so good? OK. Um, the second one, um, the list of directory authorities isn't hardwired. Yes, we come with five defaults, but you can turn those off and use your own. You could set up your own Tor network. Some guy in China could say, I'm going to build a China Tor network with these directory authorities inside China. Um, another assumption that I didn't bring up there uh, that doesn't matter too much yet is uh, they actually just monitor the firewall, the outside connections. There are a lot of people who talk to each other inside China, and they don't go through, they don't go through the same filters, the same firewalls. Um, so, yes, you could set up your own Tor network. Uh, you probably shouldn't, because splitting up the users is bad for anonymity. Uh, but we'll talk about that more later on. Uh, another big uh, key feature of Tor is that we automatically take care of building paths for you. Uh, you give us a set of servers, and we'll build some paths, and we'll, we'll do all of that in the background. Uh, so, in a sense, Tor is just a, a tool that you give it some servers, and it builds the anonymous paths and takes care of all that for you. Uh, there's a project at Harvard called Blossom where he has a separate Tor network, a separate set of directories, and the goal there is not anonymity, it's reachability. He wants to say, what does Google look like from Thailand? What does uh, my website look like from Iceland? Uh, statements like that. So Tor is just an overlay network, and you can do all sorts of things with it, and that will come in handy uh, later on. So another big feature, uh, Tor has a bunch of different roles for the servers. You can be an exit node, meaning I'm going to connect to websites and let people do whatever through me, or you can just be an internal relay. I don't want to let people connect out, but I do want to pass traffic back and forth for Tor users. Um, so the fact that you can sign up to be uh, a relay without signing up to connect to arbitrary servers uh, is really good for us. It means we have a lot more volunteers than we would have otherwise. Uh, something like a third or half of the Tor servers right now are exit nodes. So we've got 400 people who aren't willing to be exit nodes, but they're happy to help out. And um, that's how we end up with more servers than a lot of other systems out there. Um, the increased diversity that we have is what gives Tor its security. The more different choices you have for connecting to the Tor network from all these different servers, or from the Tor network from all these different servers, that's where our security comes from. 
And then another nice feature, uh, we're still around and we're growing, which is different from pretty much every other anonymity system out there. Uh, so we have a community of people who help out. Um, a lot of commercial systems in the past, either they fell apart because they didn't grow, or they constantly need to collect money from their users so they can continue to pay for their bandwidth. Uh, we rely on nice volunteers who have extra bandwidth, and we just coordinate them all into one Tor network. So we don't have to own it, we don't have to control it, you can do whatever you want to with it. Um, and the sustainability for Tor is uh, based on the open design. We tell you exactly how it works. It's modular. You can build all sorts of things with it. Um, it's free software. And we got a whole lot of users. Um, another nice feature we can build on is there are a few hundred thousand people out there who are using it, and they're a, a, a very diverse group. Um, ordinary citizens, activists, corporations, law enforcement, governments, you name it. Um, and that's why we are so sustainable, uh, because there are all these different groups who say, y you can't take anonymity away, I'm using it. You can't take my network security away, I'm using it. You can't take my traffic analysis resistance away, I'm using it. So hopefully that will uh, be very helpful to us down the road. And also, uh, there are a lot of different IP addresses that it provides. So another a uh, couple of points to make. Uh, a lot of people working on censorship resistance uh, say, we don't need anonymity, we're working on censorship resistance. Uh, let me give you a few examples for uh, why it might matter. Uh, imagine a Chinese worker uh, at some factory and she wants to blog about something that just happened at her factory. Um, the approach that a lot of censorship resistant systems use is uh, she gets her uncle in Ohio to run a relay for her and she uses that to blog about what just happened at her factory. Um, imagine that the Chinese authorities figure out who posted the blog and they say, hey, wait a minute, this person is related to the person who works at the factory. Uh, that's probably not a good thing. Uh, another issue we might worry about, uh, if any of the Tor relays, if any of the relays that you're using uh, can figure out both who you are and where you're going to, um, then the bad guys should just sign up those relays and they should start making big lists of this person did this and this person did this and this person did this. So we really need an anonymity system in the middle. Um, they don't actually have to sign anything up, they can just tell you that they did. They can just say, oh yeah, that one's easy, we, we, we're half the network, uh, we'll watch everything you do. Okay, so that's what Tor has right now, and hopefully that'll give you a bit of background on what Tor does. Um, there are a bunch of different systems out there that uh, are similar to what we're trying to build, and we're gonna try to make use of them uh, in the design I'm gonna talk about. Um, okay, so the big picture, how do you build a, a circumvention system? How do you build a proxying scheme? There are two big pieces to them. The first piece is the relay component. How do you actually build the paths? How do you actually send the traffic back and forth, do the encryption, stuff like that? The second piece is discovery. How do you figure out what the servers are? In the case of Tor, the relay component is the complex part. And the discovery part, we just added at the end. We just said, okay, there's a big directory and it has all the servers and you get it and then you know. Uh, but there are a lot of other ways that we could do it. So the easy example here uh, of how a lot of the, the proxying systems work right now are systems like anonymizer.com. It's the big computer, it lives somewhere in San Diego, all the users go to it and then go somewhere. So the idea is, uh, it's one organization that controls the proxies uh, centrally, and also you aggregate all the users onto that proxy and then go from there. Um, we can talk about the security of that compared to Tor. Uh, hopefully the picture at the beginning gave you a good sense of that. Um, the, the big issue there is uh, the adversary, if he wants to block it, can just block that big computer in San Diego. So they end up hopping and buying a lot of new IP addresses and using those for a little while and so on. Uh, we'll talk about uh, how that works in a bit also. Um, so the opposite end of the spectrum is independent personal proxies, where I get a computer and I set it up just for my cousin in China, and then I tell my cousin in China, here's the address, you should use it, don't tell anybody else. And that's great for blocking resistance. Nobody in China is ever going to notice that that thing exists because it has one user and one user in a, a country of a billion people. Doesn't matter at all. Uh, on the other hand, there's a huge scalability question. Uh, how does the guy in China find the guy in Ohio if they don't already have a, a relative there? And how does the nice guy in Ohio who says, I want to help out, find the guy in China? 
So, yes, this is a great idea, but how do you actually get it to matter for more than 12 people? And then there are open proxies. Go to Google and search for open proxy list, and you'll find lists of tens of thousands, hundreds of thousands of misconfigured or trojaned or intentionally open systems, and you can do whatever you like to with them. They're, sometimes they're SOX proxies, sometimes HTTP. Um, so there are a lot of different questions here. Um, sometimes they aren't very stable, aren't very fast. There are actually companies in Russia that go through them all and figure out which ones are good. And if you pay 10 bucks a month or uh, something like that, then you can get a, a, a better list of open proxies. So this is, there's a whole industry on how to find open proxies. Uh, on the other hand, most of them are not encrypted, which means that the filtering I talked about before could still work. They still see what you do. Uh, and then on the third hand, uh, a lot of people say, are these too convenient? Uh, who set this up and who's looking at it and, and why should I use this? Um, on the other hand, they're great for maybe bootstrapping, maybe a few connections you can do uh, at once. Uh, the Java and non-proxy folks have a design that's kind of similar to the one that I'm going to talk about today. They wrote a paper a few years ago, and uh, I haven't heard from them since about uh, what they're up to. Hopefully, they've learned a little bit, too. Um, the idea that they have is they use uh, YAP rather than Tor. Uh, we can talk about the anonymity properties between them later on also. Uh, and the way they do discovery, you go to a central website, you solve a CAPTCHA, a little thing that says, tell me what these letters are, and then it gives you uh, some address that you can use to get to the YAP network. Um, and then internal caching networks. Uh, I hear from a lot of people that there is a, a free net network running inside China. Uh, yes, you can't cross the, the firewall very well, but there are a lot of people inside, and uh, somebody goes and fetches the front page for CNN and puts it into the free net on the inside, and then a lot of people inside China can get to it. Uh, apparently, there was a talk here last year on how to build a dark net version of China, uh, a, f a free net. Um, maybe we can make use of that in some way. Um, there are definitely usability issues with uh, the current uh, Freenet implementation, and there are maybe anonymity issues with the current Freenet design, uh, depending on what it actually is, if they would ever write it down. Uh, and then there's Skype, which might be useful in some way. Uh, it's got port switching and encryption and lots of other features like that. Uh, it still has a central login server, so it's not going to totally solve our problem, but it might also be a nice tool to build on. And then there's Tor itself. There are 30,000 people, give or take, in China using Tor right now. And they don't, I mean, they don't mind the anonymity properties, but they're using it so they can actually get to the websites they want to talk to. Uh, Tor's website is blocked all over. It's blocked in Egypt and various uh, uh, Arab groups and China and Thailand and uh, the LA Times. Uh, a lot of different places block the Tor website. Uh, but nobody that I've heard of blocks the Tor network. Why is this? Uh, one answer is tens of thousands of users. Who cares? That's nothing. Nobody's using it. Um, another answer is that we've publicized it as Tor is for experts. Tor is for people who know what they're doing. Uh, one easy way of doing that is to distribute it in uh, only English and Deutsch and Russian and things like that. We don't have a Chinese version that's very uh, useful yet. So maybe that uh, helps a lot. Uh, another answer is that we've always been talking about it as Tor is for civil liberties. Tor is for people in uh, North America and Europe who really need to have security against their corporations and their governments and uh, things like that. We've never been talking about it as Tor is for human rights people who don't have very good internet connections. Uh, so maybe that means that uh, they don't think of it as a threat. Uh, nobody has gone to the, the governor or the president or whatever the name is in China and said, hey, why are you not blocking Tor? These guys are going to destroy our civilization. Uh, but I guess the key point here is that we should realize we're already in the arms race. There are already tens of thousands of users in China using it, and they haven't stopped them. So, yes, we're up against a very powerful adversary, but it's not... He, the adversary is not trying to crack down every single time, every single uh, opportunity. They're taking the correct opportunities, they're taking their time, maybe they're slow, maybe they don't mind so much. Okay, so what do we need to add to Tor so that we can actually have these sort of systems? Um, one easy answer is we got a lot of users. We've got hundreds of thousands of people out there who are using Tor. What if we give them a little button in the GUI that says Tor for Freedom? 
and the user clicks the button, and now they turn into a little relay. They relay 10 kilobytes a second. That's nothing for people on uh, broadband or universities, uh, but it's a whole lot for a guy in uh, Namibia who doesn't have a, a good network connection otherwise. Um, and they don't have to be exit connections. They can just be internal relays. They relay from the guy in Thailand to them to the rest of the Tor network. So the idea is we've got a lot of different users who will make a connection, a bridge, from all the users who are blocked from the main Tor network so they can get to the Tor network. And to do that, we need a separate set of directory authorities. We need a, a bridge authority that keeps track of all the different bridges out there so we can be able to give them to the right people. Um, this is a little bit tricky because if we just use the same directory authority code, then you, you go to the bridge authority and you say, hey, can you tell me every bridge out there? And it says, yeah, here's the list. Uh, that would be really bad because then China should go to the authority and say, who are the ones I should block? So, a little fix can fix that. Uh, the basic idea is if you already know about a bridge, if you know about its identity key, you can go to the bridge authority and say, uh, I need an updated version of the server descriptor for this guy. Tell me about where he is now, what his keys are now, what his exit policy and rate limiting and so on are right now. So if you know about him, you can get a, a fresh version describing all the properties of him. But if you don't know about his identity key, there's no way to look him up. So, yes, the bridge authority might have 80,000 people, but you can go there to learn updates about the ones you already know. You can't learn all of them. Um, and another key point is that the bridges should publish their new descriptors using Tor. Otherwise, China should go to the bridge authority and watch all the people making encrypted connections to it and say, that's a bridge, that's a bridge, that's a bridge. But if you use Tor, we have an anonymity system already. Uh, why not use it? One of the other key points here is once you have a working bridge, once the guy in China has some way to get to the Tor network and the bridge authorities, he's all set. He just uses that. He can get to the, the whole rest of the internet. He can get to the bridge authorities to get a few more bridges. Uh, so once you have one, you're in business. You've got a whole connection to the rest of the internet. So what we've done here is we've changed it from how do we keep China from learning 800 IP addresses? How do we keep China from learning the main Tor uh, directory? To now we have 50,000 IP addresses. How do we give them to the good guys in China without letting the bad guys learn all of them? So far, so good? Great. OK, so another big thing that we have to fix, and I'm going to skip over this for the most part, is uh, hiding Tor's network fingerprint. Uh, right now, if you watch what happens in a TCP dump when you do a Tor handshake, you will find the, the string Tor in the handshake because we try to be polite and follow the RFCs and you know, specify what sort of certificates we're going to provide. Uh, maybe that was a really bad idea with respect to making Tor uh, hard to filter. Uh, but that's, that's one of the big things that we need to fix. Another piece is that right now when you're doing directory connections, uh, some of those happen with HTTP in plain text. They're signed, so there's no integrity issue, but you can actually see some guy asks for the web page slash tor slash blah, blah, blah. And uh, I, I think I noticed a, uh, a firewall product that came out recently that has a, an IDS signature for somebody fetching a web page that starts with slash tor slash. Uh, so that certainly we can solve. Uh, and the easy answer for that is that we should push everything through the Tor TLS connections, uh, not only the Tor traffic, but also the directory uh, requests. And we need to pick a good default port. Um, right now, some of the defaults are port 9001, which looks very odd for people who are just web browsing otherwise. Uh, if we have most of the bridges uh, open up port 443 by default, we'll be doing better. Um, and we need to make it look like a more ordinary, I'm connecting to my bank, what's the problem, uh, sort of handshake, which gets complex when you start looking at uh, timing fingerprints. Uh, if the adversary uh, has been paying attention to the recent work on detecting encrypted BitTorrent, then they might start to say, hey, wait a minute, I don't care if it's encrypted, I can still see that you're sending a lot of bytes this way and sending a lot of bytes this way, and, and no bank does that. You're not 
browsing at your bank, you're you know, doing something else with this encrypted connection. Uh, so it really depends how much the adversary is going to pay attention. Uh, and that goes back to the earlier statement of he doesn't have that much computation available for every single connection. Once we have 100 million people in China who are making encrypted connections back and forth, uh, nobody's going to look at every single one of them and say, are you, uh, are you actually talking to a bank? Are you actually talking to eBay, E-Trade, all the other uh, encrypted connections they might make? Okay, so those are the first two things we need to fix. We need to figure out how to do bridges and bridge authorities, and we need, we need to figure out how to fix the TLS handshake. And the third one is discovery. Uh, how do we actually let uh, poor Alice in China figure out what bridges she can use? So the easy answer is uh, Tor is very modular. So uh, we've separated the relay component from the discovery component. We can use any discovery component we like. Great, we're all set. Uh, except we don't have a perfect discovery component. Even, if, even though it's modular, we still don't know the best answer. Uh, and hopefully we can uh, help to solve that uh, today and the next couple of days. So the first issue is bootstrapping. How does Alice find her first bridge? How does she get out and learn something that she can connect with? And the answer for that is the firewall is not perfect. She's already getting out and reading various websites. She's just doing it in a very inconvenient way. Um, I hear that people SMS each other, uh, hey, I found a new open proxy, here it is. And then it works for a few days until somebody stops it, and then they send each other a new open proxy. Um, there are people who connect to World of Warcraft, and they, they don't actually play the game, they just sit around chatting about new open proxies they found. Uh, Okay, great. Um, and there are people who use Skype and other connections like that to get around the firewall. So they're doing it right now. Uh, the firewall is not perfect. There are a lot of people who uh, have a friend who opens up uh, SSH and they just make a tunnel out and they're all set. So there are ways of doing this. And if you don't know how to, then hopefully your friend does and you can make an initial connection and learn about a bridge at first. Um, Okay, so how do we actually do this? There are a lot of different ways that we could do discovery. Um, and I'm going to describe uh, five or six different ways. And, uh, and the idea isn't that we have to figure out which one's best and just use that one. We should deploy all of them and find out which one's best. So the first one is independent bridges with no central discovery. It's just like the circumventor and CGI proxy and other ones I talked about before. Uh, the idea is uh, I know somebody in Germany or the US and he's going to run a bridge for me and I'm going to use that bridge. So hopefully I have a social network that extends outside of China, uh, otherwise I can't use this approach. Um, so hopefully I know the bridge's operator or maybe a friend of mine does. Uh, the telling a friend uh, idea has some pretty interesting incentives behind it because if I know about a bridge and I tell my friend, if he screws up, if he gets it blocked, I can't use it anymore. So uh, maybe I'll have to make some good decisions whether I want to tell my friend about it because I want to stay connected too. Um, and the other piece of that is that you're mapping your social network for the attacker. Let's say I tell all of my close friends who are other dissidents about it, and then the adversary learns about that bridge. And he watches who connects to it, and he says, oh, these 12 people are using that bridge. That's very interesting. I didn't know that those 12 people were friends. So we need to be careful about how we actually build that sort of thing. Um, but once we've got that, that's the easy part, that's just, you know, you use Tor except you use a new hop before you get to the Tor network. The next step is families of bridges. The idea is uh, Tor takes care of all this circuit building in the background, so why not have uh, the nice guy on Ohio, in Ohio run 20 different bridges? Or maybe it's a consortium, it's a Linux users group in Toronto, and each of them runs a bridge and they all put them into the same family, which means that, the, that Alice in China can learn about all 20 of them at once. And that means that if 10 of them go away for a little while or they turn their computers off or they're on dynamic IP addresses and they get a new IP address, uh, Alice isn't screwed. She, are, she still knows about some and she can connect to the bridge authority and learn about the new locations for all the rest of them. And that way she can stay connected. As long as one of them is still up at any given time, she can learn about the new locations for all the rest of them. 
And all of this happens in the background. It's all automated. Um, so hopefully we're in a lot better shape than uh, systems like CGI proxy, where you just say, uh, hey, uh, can you please run this on your Windows computer for me? And when you turn your Windows computer off, I'm screwed, and I have to either wait till you wake up and turn it on or find another friend or something like that. So far, so good? OK. So that's great, but what about bridges who don't know any users? Or what about users who don't know any people who can run bridges for them? Uh, so that, for that approach, we need some sort of public discovery system. We need some sort of system where I'm in China, I don't know anybody outside of China, but I still want to be able to, to get some bridges and make some connections to the Tor network and then to the rest of the internet. Uh, so the idea here is uh, some people in Ohio are going to say, I really want to help out, but I don't know anybody in China, so put me into the public bridge pool. Uh, let people know about me, and hopefully something good will happen. Uh, so we can break them up into different pools based on their identity key, which is what they generate when they become a, a Tor relay. Uh, and we want to break those into different distribution strategies. And the idea is each of these distribution strategies is going to have a different property that it tries to, to force the adversary to show. Uh, maybe some of them are going to say, you spend a lot of time to attack this, this distribution strategy. Maybe other ones are going to say, uh, you need to solve all these CAPTCHAs to attack this one. Uh, so the idea is to exercise a different uh, scarce resource for each one of these. And this means uh, an attacker might be able to attack some of them, but not very many attackers should be able to attack all of them. And I'll tell you more about that uh, as I describe some. So the first one is a very simple one. We have maybe 100 bridges in that pool, and only 10 of them are available in a given hour. So if you ask for a bridge over the course of a given hour, it gives you one of those 10. In the next hour, it switches to a new group of 10, and it only gives you one of those. And in the next hour, it switches to a new group of 10. So if you want to learn all the bridges in that pool, you need to keep on asking for many hours in a row. So you have to care and pay somebody to stay up and, and keep asking uh, all the time. So that's it's not foolproof. Uh, I hear that China can employ people to use the internet for long periods of time. Uh, but Maybe some other attackers won't be, won't be willing to do that. Uh, maybe the US uh, corporation that says no Tor uh, on our network uh, won't hire another person to go figure out who all the bridges are that people can use. Um, so there are a couple of helpful points. Uh, first of all, it'll help people to bootstrap until it is blocked, and it'll be blocked at different points in different uh, attackers. And hopefully it'll be a start. It's not perfect, but it's an easy one to build initially. Uh, so another strategy is based on IP address. If you're coming from a certain network on the internet, then we give you uh, this bridge address. If you're coming from over here, then we give you this bridge address. So if China wants to learn all the addresses in this pool, then they have to come from a lot of different places on the internet. And again, I hear that China has a, a lot of different places on the internet, so it isn't perfect. But they at least have to figure out how to make the connections from a lot of different places and, and actually do that over time. So it's not going to be perfect again, but it forces them to do a different uh, exercise than they did for the first one. So far, so good. And then the third approach is combine them. Um, over a given hour, when you're coming from this place, give them this one. When you're coming from this place, give them this one, and so on. And then for the next hour, there's a new set, and they're distributed based on your IP address. So this means that not only do you have to have a lot of different networks that you control, but you also have to do the requests for many hours in a row or many days in a row, depending on how many volunteers we have. Um, so. It's a nice start. Um, it's not going to be foolproof, but uh, it will at least force people to continuously attack us. And the approach they do right now is they just pull down the directory and filter it all. Uh, so we're doing better. Um, a fourth trick might be uh, there's a project out there called Circumventor, and they run a mailing list. You show up and you say, uh, can you add this Yahoo address to your mailing list? And then every three or four days, they send out a new set of 10 bridge addresses. And Yes, China could sign up on the list also, but they don't react that quickly. Uh, so, so far, Circumventor sends out a new list every three or four days because three or four days is about what it takes for China to block the ones that they sent out. Um, maybe we'll have to speed this up to every one or two days. Maybe it'll be every six hours. Uh, 
if we get to that point, it probably won't work so well. But certainly when we start, uh, China isn't even going to care. They're not even going to know this is happening. So we'll see. It might work great. It might not work at all. Uh, and then a fifth strategy is uh, you send us an email and we send you a bridge address. That's all there is to it. And we don't answer more than once, so you have to create a new email address if you want a new answer. Um, and we could require a CAPTCHA. You have to fill in the little letters that you see in this picture. And I don't have to write my own CAPTCHA code. I can just say it needs to be a Gmail address or a Yahoo address. And I'll let them take care of uh, figuring out how to delay uh, more user creation. So hopefully that'll be another start. And uh, uh, I can you know, leverage Yahoo's uh, CAPTCHA experts to take care of that side of it for me. Uh, I don't know if this one will be perfect either, but I'm optimistic. It seems like a good start. Um, and who knows which adversaries are going to be able to attack which ones of these. We'll find out uh, as we do it. And then the sixth one, just to demonstrate that we can get as complex as we want to on this, uh, imagine some sort of reputation system. Um, find 12 people in China that you, that you really trust and give them uh, 100 bridge addresses each and give them a bunch of little uh, trust tokens. And then what they do is they say, uh, I really trust my friend over here. I'm going to give him some of the bridge addresses. Now he can get to the internet too. And I'm going to give him some of these tokens. And Imagine there's some database somewhere, and you show up with a token, and it gives you an account. Um, and then these people are able to learn new bridges too. So you go to the database and you say, hey, here's my account. Uh, can I learn some new bridges now? And if we like him, we'll talk about what that means later, then we give him some new bridges. And if we don't like him, then we say, sorry, you don't get any more bridges. Or we say, uh, yes, certainly, here are some bridges that we know are blocked, jerk. Um, so. <laughs> There are a lot of approaches we can use for that. Uh, so the idea is, how do, we, how do we figure out if we like him? Uh, one answer is, if the addresses we gave him last time ended up blocked, that's a bad sign. Either he's the adversary and he blocked them, or he doesn't have very good friends because he gave them to somebody who ended up getting them blocked. Uh, so it's sort of complex. It gets, uh, it gets pretty bad pretty quickly. Uh, how do we decide how to actually measure if he's a bad person? Uh, but I can certainly imagine working on this for a while and coming up with a design that uh, would work for a few months and maybe we'd have to uh, fix it once China figured out how to break that one. But this is all an arms race. Uh, so it gets really messy really quickly. Um, and then distribution strategies seven and eight, I have no idea. But when bridges sign up to be uh, the, in these public distribution strategies, uh, we should keep these in reserve. We should keep a couple of them uh, unused, we didn't tell them to anybody, because uh, what if China breaks one, two, three, four, five, six all at once, and there are no bridges? And then there's a new uh, media article that comes out in China saying, yeah, we, we took care of that tour thing, it doesn't work anymore. Uh, and it's true, we don't have any bridges, there's nothing to give anybody that isn't already blocked, uh, that would be really bad. So the idea is we have these extra, uh, maybe 20% of the bridges that are signed up, and we don't give them to anybody, and if the worst happens and all these others are, are broken, then we think really quickly and come up with some strategies that uh, aren't so easy to break, and now we have some bridges available uh, that we can start using immediately for those. Um, so one of my questions for you is, uh, what other strategies should we use here? What other scarce resources for an attacker? Don't necessarily think just of China. Think of uh, Symantec, for example. They might want to not let Tor work. What sort of scarce resources should we measure to try to have as much diversity as possible in terms of how we do these distributions? Um, one thing that I've thought about is SMS messages. Maybe you SMS somewhere and it sends you back a bridge address. And maybe that's per phone number number or per something like that. Um, so let me know what you think. Uh, one of the great things here is that I'm finally in the role of the attacker. I'm, I don't have to defend against every possible attack. I just have to make one that works. Um, so if you're going to see George's talk later on, uh, George Denisis on how to do traffic analysis, things like that, uh, all he has to do is break it somehow. 
I have to defend against everything with Tor. So finally we switched the roles around and I can attack something and I just have to come up with one of these strategies that works. If, if the, the email list works, then we're all set. We, we've done it and there are going to be uh, tens of thousands of people using Tor in China and it'll be hard to block them. Uh, whereas China has to figure out how to defend against every one of these. They have to decide how to allocate their resources. And it's not just China. Symantec has to figure out how to allocate their, their three sysadmins to attack all of these different strategies and figure out how to keep the, 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 the poor employees from having good security on the internet. Uh, so, So the key point here is that by deploying all of them, we make all of them more likely to succeed because we're going to distract the attacker with all these other ones that maybe he can break, but he has to think about breaking those as well as all the other ones. So we'll see how that goes. Um, okay, so one of the big problems is how do we learn if a bridge has been blocked? Because maybe I have a lot of people signing up bridges and maybe some adversaries are learning about them and putting them on their blacklists. Uh, do I give out ones that are blocked? Do I give out ones that are not blocked? How do I even know? I'm not in China. I haven't used it. So one answer is active testing. Uh, I should have a bunch of users in China, in Thailand, in all these different countries and corporations that do the testing for me. I give them a list of bridges. They say, yeah, I could connect to these three. I couldn't connect to these three. Uh, now you know. That's great, but shouldn't the adversary sign up users? And then I'll say, hey, what do you think about these 12 bridges? And he'll say, oh yeah, those are fine. And then he'll put them on his blacklist. So how do I pick users in China to actually do this measurement for me? Um, and even if we have trusted users that we know are good, the adversary is going to figure it out eventually. He's going to say, that guy over there keeps measuring the whole internet. Uh, I should keep track of what he's trying to connect to. And now I get to learn all the bridges. So it's a start, but it has some problems. Another issue is, uh, another approach is passive testing. Each of the bridges comes with a little two megabyte GeoIP database. It knows when somebody connects, this guy's connecting from Syria, this guy's connecting from Egypt, this guy's connecting from China. There are some anonymity issues here if it publishes all the IP addresses of the people that it sees. But maybe once a day it says, I got 27 connections from Syria, I got 3,000 connections from China, I got zero connections from uh, Uzbekistan. Uh, so it's a start, it'll give us some notion. If maybe it, we get a lot of connections from a certain country and then no connections from a certain country, then we can start to say, uh, I bet they're attacking, I bet they're trying to figure out bridges and blocking them. On the other hand, if uh, we get no connections from Burma for uh, two days, does that mean that they're just asleep in Burma and they're not trying to use it? Or does that mean that Burma actually blocked all of the bridges that we gave them? Um, so it gets uh, hard to figure that out too. Um, so the, 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 the solution that we'll probably end up with is a combination. We want to use active testing and we want to do this passive GeoIP measurement to try to get some intuition. And I don't really know how to combine these, so if you already know how to do this, uh, come chat with me afterwards. Okay, all the other fun issues that come up. Um, one of the, the interesting things here, uh, a lot of people make the assumption that as oppression gets worse in a country, as they start to filter more things and censor more things, it becomes more and more dangerous to use Tor. I'm not convinced of this, because from what I've seen, as the oppression becomes worse, there are more and more Tor users in that country. And they're not using it because they want to organize protests and dissidents and stuff. They're using it because they can't get to the websites they used to be able to get to. They want to read their weblogs and their webcomics, and they want to shop on Amazon like they did last week. They're just ordinary people on the internet who are using Tor because they're forced to use Tor. So as the oppression gets worse in a country, the, the median use, the ordinary user, becomes more acceptable. Uh, so this is a, an unintuitive thing that it's worth thinking about. Um, Tor actually becomes more acceptable as the country cracks down more and more. Uh, and then a big open question, uh, trusting local hardware and software. Uh, in certain countries, they don't all have new IBM laptops that they bought. They have the, the cafe in the village that you go to. And boy, is there a video camera in that internet cafe. And even if there isn't, 
It's a Windows 98 computer, and a bunch of people have used it before uh, Alice shows up. Uh, how can she really trust that this thing is running Tor? How can she really trust anything at this point? So one answer is maybe a USB stick that has a little program on it that we've analyzed and documented and we can trust. Uh, maybe another answer is a live CD. She shows up and she pops in her Ubuntu Tor disk and, and she's on her way. Uh, it really depends a lot on the, the hardware we're looking at. Uh, another big question, how many bridges do you need to know about? Um, obviously, if you know about one, that works as long as that one bridge is around. Um, yes, maybe the adversary can block it, but even ignoring that, uh, Comcast systems go down. Um, helpful volunteers who are Tor users, their computers disappear, they turn them off, they catch fire, lots of things happen, and ha one might not be enough. Is two enough? Is six enough? Uh, what is the rate of churn of these volunteers that we might have? And how do we figure out how to, how to change that adaptively so that we can give people enough bridges? Um, and then the other half is, even if you know about eight bridges, how often should you look for updates? Should you go to the bridge authority every minute to say, is there a new one now? Is there a new one now? Or do you go there once a day? Is that too uh, infrequent? I don't know. And then another big piece is uh, cable modems don't usually run big websites. So China doesn't have to block the whole internet. They can just say, all those Comcast users, they're useless. No connections to Comcast. All those uh, uh, broadband users in Germany, they don't run actual websites. No connections to those. And maybe this will be where all our volunteers come from. And if that's true, we're in bad shape. So one answer is we need to get uh, Google and AOL and lots of other places like that to run bridges also. Um, we also need to think a little bit about economic pressure. Maybe China goes to Verizon and says, your users are, uh, are endangering our political system. Can you please make them stop? And now Verizon starts having a, a no tour bridges policy. Uh, so this gets political very quickly, but uh, uh, hopefully that will be solvable too. Another big question, publicity attracts attention. Uh, we talked earlier about how they only end up filtering things that are uh, well publicized or well used. Uh, so a lot of circumvention tools launch with a huge media splash. They have New York Times articles saying, we just wrote a new tool and it'll be great, we're gonna solve everything. Uh, bad publicity attracts the attention of the censors and they're forced to block it. Even if it doesn't work very well, even if nobody's using it, they have to act because the, the daughter of the general is saying, uh, Daddy, I hear that we're not blocking the, the internet very well today. Uh, what's going on there? And then he has to do something about it. Uh, so the key point here is that we can control the pace of the arms race. Uh, we can decide how, how embarrassed the, the Chinese officials are, and that will force them to act or force them to not need to act yet. So one of the key points here is, I don't want New York Times articles about this, uh, probably ever. Uh, I think the, the key approach is to give it to individuals and say, here are some bridges, you can use them, uh, tell your friends, but, but don't tell the press. Uh, so uh, hopefully I haven't made a huge mistake by coming here to, to tell you guys my idea. Um, if you have any ideas about how to break this or fix it or make it better, uh, please let me know. It's still in the design phase, so there's a, a lot that can be fixed and there's a lot more work that needs to be done. So the next steps, uh, technical solutions aren't gonna solve the whole problem. These things are really effective socially. It isn't that there are a lot of people in China saying, man, I wish I could get to the real internet. It's a shame that my country doesn't let me. There are a lot of people in China saying, good thing my country censors the internet, otherwise I'd be seeing all that bad stuff that I don't really want to look at. And as long as socially they're succeeding, as long as most people in these countries say, good thing my internet is censored, then it's not entirely a technical problem. Uh, on the other hand, we really do need a, a technical solution for that piece of it. We need a good answer for the technical piece because there are people who want censorship resistance. There are people who want to be able to get around the firewall, and we want to make it as easy as possible for them. Maybe they'll tell their friends. Who knows what happens after that? So the next steps are we need to deploy some, uh, all of this stuff, build it, deploy it, see what happens, uh, try the discovery strategies I talked about, uh, try the strategies you're going to tell me about tomorrow, and uh, get some intuition for how these things work. Um, and I should also notice that uh, Tor itself needs to keep 
going. There's an ongoing discussion around the world with uh, law enforcement and corporations and other things like that where a lot of people say, I don't have anything to hide. Why should we have these tools on the internet? Yeah, you're letting the, the, the folks at Indie Media uh, not get arrested, but, but anonymity is bad and we need to turn it all off. So there are a lot of discussions that we have at, at a lot of different levels in government and, and different policy groups on why we need uh, security on the internet. Um, another big issue is data retention. Uh, if I weren't working full-time on building Tor, I'd be working full-time on fighting data retention. Uh, this is a huge issue, and Europe is the place where it is right now. Not only does it threaten the privacy and safety of the ordinary people and the corporations and the governments that are trying to push for it, it also isn't going to catch any of the bad people. Bad people are doing great on the internet. Uh, we don't need to cripple our citizens just to make all the politicians feel happier. So uh, we need help on all of these things. Uh, if you guys want to run some Tor servers, uh, that would be fabulous. Um, there are signs all around the outside saying, use more bandwidth. Uh, it, you have laptops. Uh, I want to see you know, 50 Tor servers in this room after a little while. Um, and more volunteers, there are a lot of things that we need to do, uh, documentation, translation, uh, research, design, implementation, deployment, usability, uh, the list goes on and on. We need help. There are only three of us trying to work on this at this point. We've got hundreds of thousands of users. I get a lot of mail every day saying, hey, I tried to do this and it didn't quite work. Can you help me understand Windows? Uh, I'd love to have some more people. <laughs> who can help answer those sorts of things. Um, and if you know anybody who wants to help us with funding or donations, uh, that'd be great too. Thank you. Um. Hi, Roger. Okay, there's time for, uh, I've got 45 minutes or more, so I don't know uh, what Andreas is going to do for the time, but we've got time for questions, comments? Okay, I want to say thank you very much for your lecture. My name is Padelun from Furboot. Uh, we run a, already run a Tor server, and I have here $1,000 funding for use, and I want to come to you to give it to you. Ooh. And Thank you. Mm -hmm. And right now at room four, there's a meeting for, uh, against data retention. Now. Hmm? Thank you. Other questions, comments, people with thousands of dollars? <laughs> Hi, um, a URL would, would be cool. Do you have a URL? Where should I um, go to? Tor.eff.org okay. or Google for Tor. We're the, the number one hit for that. Um, <laughs> we beat out the publisher a little while ago. There's a, uh, a document that describes all of this also. Uh, come chat with me and I'll point you where it is. I'd love to have some more feedback on it. Other people with yeah, microphones? Here? Yeah. Um, when you talked about the first connection that Alice has to make, um, if you have like a really strong attacker and he can like totally monitor your connection, if like the first bridge gets tainted, can he like lure you into a honey net and like simulate that you're in a Tor network but you're not? No. And the reason for this is that the Tor software comes with the addresses and keys of the, the, the main Tor directory authorities. So what Alice is going to do is she's going to connect to the bridge and then she's going to connect to the main directory authorities and say, tell me who's in the Tor network really. And then she's going to get a signed answer and she can check the signature on it and then she'll know that she's using the real Tor network. And from there she can build three different hops knowing that she's building them through different servers and that way the, the bridge uh, or whoever's attacking her here uh, can't influence where she ends up popping out. Do you so, buy that? Okay, yeah, so you would have to fake the keys. You would have to break into three of the five main Tor directory authorities 
as well as attacking the bridge. Okay, cool. Uh, Roger. Um, I'm over here. Uh, question. Uh, uh, as Tor becomes a priority for, for oppressive governments more and more, let's assume that this happens, uh, even though we can sort of steer how badly this is going to happen. Let's assume it becomes a big priority. And Western companies start opposing you. Start, you start opposing teams of really good techies that really want to make your technology not work. Um, which it is going to happen, I think. At some point, this will happen. Um, how, how much sense does it make you think to start working against them, to start making them look bad? To, uh, how much of your energy would you invest in, in opposing your opposers instead of, of, of making your technology better? Where, where, in, in your mind, where does that, where does that scale is? Where, where is the... Uh... In my mind, as, a, as the developer and designer, what I need to do is I need to make the software really good. And if there is easy to use, secure, well-documented, well-understood modular software out there, we all win. It's just, it, that's all there is to it. The software will take over the world and that will be it. Uh, in terms of the, the social and political uh, discussions at the same time, yes, those need to happen. Uh, I'm probably not the best person for those. I'm relying on all of you to help out on that respect. Uh, but from my perspective, what, what Tor needs to focus on is making the software really good. Because the better the software is, the harder it is for all those people to actually try to attack it. Uh, I'm pretty confident that we can build uh, secure anonymity software that large companies can't beat. So what we need to do is build it. And we need your help. Did I mention that? Another part of the response to that question is that Western companies, some of them will attack it, but Verizon can be embarrassed out of working with China. You know, Yahoo was heavily embarrassed after their uh, actions led to arrests in China. Uh, various large companies that maybe we can't name are actually talking about entering into protocols about the way that they do business. Uh, and a lot of these companies use Tor for their own security. They don't want it to go away. Right, so if you work for someone, make sure you uh, try and push upwards and say, hey, this is a, a good protocol we should be supporting rather than something we should be working to block. I agree. Uh, you just mentioned again that uh, companies and governments are using Tor. Could you just elaborate for a minute for what kinds of use? So uh, that's a separate talk, which uh, I can give at a separate point. Uh, but there are a couple of examples. Um, let's say you want to check out a competitor's website, and you don't want them to know that you're, uh, that you're the one doing it. You want to know uh, what product they're going to come out with next. Uh, so you should use Tor to go to their website and figure that out. That's one answer. Um, another answer, there are Navy soldiers, U.S. Navy soldiers in the Middle East right now who are using Tor to connect back to their servers in Maryland. They don't want somebody watching the, the, the house they're in in Iraq to say, hey, wait a minute, uh, those guys are from the U.S. Navy. And they don't want people watching the servers in Maryland to say, I know the, the current location of this team. So that's a, that, those, are, those are a few examples of why these different people need their security on the Internet. Imagine, I mean, when do you need encryption? Uh, Tor is useful for all sorts of situations where you want to uh, protect your current location from somebody that you're talking to, or you want to protect uh, the person that you're talking to from somebody watching you locally. Is that a good enough answer? Thank you. Hello. Uh, I have a question. Is it uh, dangerous to have a Tor server in China or other way around? Uh, do I have any possibility to detect users uh, using Tor? Uh, is it dangerous to have a Tor server in China? Yes. Uh, I have no idea. You should ask somebody in China. Okay. We, we do have Tor servers in China right now. Uh, there are a half dozen fast Tor servers running at Chinese universities, uh, possibly operated by the government, I'm not sure. There are a half dozen fast Tor servers running at Chinese ISPs, also possibly operated by the government. I'm not sure. Uh, so they're running. Uh, I have no idea. Uh, how can I search for Tor users? How can you search for Chinese users? Yeah, for Tor users in uh, China. For, 
Okay. Um, there are a couple of answers to that, and we're fixing each of them, so my eventual answer will be, uh, <laughs> that won't be very easy. Um, go back to the GOIP discussion that I had before. If you're the first hop, then you can say, I know Alice is using Tor, but I don't know what she's doing but I know that she's the one using it. So that, that's the easy answer. You can say, there's a user coming from China, they're going into Tor, I don't know what they're doing, but I know they're using it. Is that good enough? Mm -hmm. Okay, yes. Uh, I'm sorry, uh, the Tor as a network, do you have the network monitoring tools, like analyzing tools to see who is attacking you? Do we have network monitoring tools to see who is attacking? No. Uh, Why not? Uh, part of it is because we're working on the anonymity side. Another part is that we don't know how to build good monitoring tools that don't harm the security of the system. And a third part of it is that we're real busy. Uh, would you like to help us build some? Uh, probably, probably so. Well, it's the war and you need to have some, uh, some tools for this war. If you run the network, you need to know what's going on. If you run an anonymity network, you really don't want to know what's going on. <laughs> and I should, I should also point out that we don't run the anonymity network. We run a few servers here and there. You guys run the anonymity network. Uh, then they'll kill you. Uh, Chinese and the government and whoever it is. That's uh, another... Uh, uh, discussion that uh, hopefully we won't have to have anytime soon. Uh, my main goal is to make sure that the software exists and at that point maybe I'm not the top target anymore. It's good for you. Uh, you were talking about denial of service by blocking of nodes. What's about exceeding bandwidth? Uh, what about exceeding the bandwidth of the nodes? Of the uh, Tor network. Oh, of the Tor network. Uh, that's a good question, because right now there are 800 Tor servers and hundreds of thousands of users. We're pushing over 100 megabytes per second of traffic on average. This is more, I think it's about the same as what Wikipedia pushes uh, at this point. So we're pushing a lot of traffic and there aren't very many actual relays who've volunteered to, to work on that. And a lot, of that reason, a lot of that is why the Tor network is not as fast as it could be, is why Stephen had to run his own Tor network when he did his uh, experiments. Uh, in terms of people intentionally attacking the Tor network to knock it down, uh, the easy answer to defend against that is that we need to grow bigger. Yeah, of course. That's the answer. Uh, we're, and we're in the process of growing bigger. Uh, we've got 800 servers now. We're doubling every four to six months. But I think his store is growing bigger and it's, getting, it's attracting more users. So um, there will still be a base load um, on which an uh, attacker can level, leverage. Yes, so there are a lot of different pieces to making the Tor network faster. Uh, one of the big pieces is making it easier for people to become a server. Um, we've got some new uh, front-end software called Vidalia that is the, the GUI. It's got a snazzy little bandwidth graph. It shows you a map of the Earth with all the little Tor servers on it, and it makes a little uh, uh, diagram to show where the circuits are, uh, sort of like the, the satellite photo in sneakers, if you're familiar with that, where you get to actually watch the, uh, the, the connections going along. So that makes people very excited to use Tor. And there's a little button now, and you click it, and it says, now I'm a Tor server. And if we can make that button really easy to find, first of all, <laughs> and then second of all, and then second of all, we need to make it do good things on the back end. We need to make Tor easy to use, easy to turn into a server, get the bandwidth limiting right so that you can limit external connections without also limiting yourself, uh, make it work even on esoteric, archaic oper operating systems like Windows and uh, stuff like that, then we'll be in a lot better shape. There's a lot of work to be done before we get to the point where, uh, where it's trivial to run a Tor server everywhere. But that's what we're working on. Thank you. Um, what relation, are there any competition relationships or synergies to the I2P anonymizing project? 
We chat with them every so often. Uh, part of the big problem here is that there are a lot of uh, unknown research issues. We don't know uh, how to do this, how to do that, how many hops you should use, how you actually do the, the uh, choice for your circuits. There are a lot of different uh, open research questions in terms of how to be secure when you're making all these design decisions. Uh, I2P takes very different approaches. Uh, to answering a lot of these design decisions uh, than Tor does. Uh, unfortunately, uh, they're all open research questions, so we don't know if we are right or they are right. Um, so we're, we're both trying to get better intuition about how to answer those, but the next step for both sides is that we need to actually sit down and say, uh, is this approach more safe or is this approach more safe? And there's a whole research community trying to answer these questions. So uh, are you planning any kind of networking interfaces? No. Um, if I2P ever has some users, uh, then we might, you know, notice them more. Okay, thank you. Um, yeah, I, I just want to ask, are there any exit nodes in China? Yes. Okay, that's why. Because I was in China for the last year, and actually I used Tor, and then sites were blocked. So, you just have to reload, but it's just... Yeah, it is uh, uh, a shame that uh, various uh, places on the internet are censored in various ways. And sometimes, uh, some Tor user in Ohio tries to go to BBC and they can't, because the exit node they came out of said, uh, I'm sorry, you can't do that. Uh, a, a stronger example is we were looking at uh, a Tor exit node that was doing SSL man-in-the-middle attacks. Every time you go to E-Trade or any uh, SSL website, it would give you a self-signed certificate. It would replace the, certi the certificate of the website you're going to with its own. And a lot of people with tinfoil hats said, oh my god, there's a bad guy, there's a, he, he's running a Tor exit node and he's trying to attack everybody. It turned out that it was some guy on broadband in China and his ISP was doing a man-in-the-middle attack for every SSL website that he went to and the poor Tor users were getting attacked along with him. So there are a lot of complex things that, that go on when you start uh, having a global overlay network and letting people pop out anywhere around the world. Uh, do you actively take out those Do we actively take out those nodes? Uh, sort of. Um, so the, the easy answer is almost all the time those nodes are uh, accidentally misconfigured. So we send mail to them and say, hey, you screwed up on your, your firewall. Can you stop screwing up all the Tor users? And then they say, oh, oops, sorry, it's fixed. Um, if we send them mail and they don't fix it, then yes, we actively take out those nodes. And the way that works is the five directory authorities. Um, I run two of them. Peter runs one. Um, and there are a few others around the world. Um, and we, we know each other and we say, hey, this, this server is broken and it's not making Tor work. Uh, we need to blacklist it until they fix it. Hi. Um, whoops. Because of the fact that Tor allows users to run as internal nodes, um, I was curious if there were any implications of uh, bandwidth starvation if uh, Tor, for instance, ever ran into a scenario where users were not able to get to the outside at a reasonable rate. So the question is, how do you do load balancing so you don't uh, overload the exit nodes? Because if you pick randomly for all the nodes and then you only choose exit nodes for the last one, the last guys are going to see a lot more load than the, the internal nodes. Um, so the easy answer is uh, you do a little math and you, you provide a proportion of bandwidth less for those exit nodes when you're picking the middle hops. Uh, and that means that you are less likely to pick exit nodes in the first couple hops of your path, but the load balancing works out. Uh, it's also maybe bad for anonymity, because if our goal is to choose from a really large set of servers at every step, but we don't choose exit nodes as much for the first few steps, uh, we're not being as secure as we could be. But on the other hand, it works better, and that seems to be more important. Is there any um, sort of bias trying to choose band or uh, nodes that have large exit bandwidth? Um? Yes, every Tor server advertises the capacity that it thinks it has, and the way it does that is it watches what bandwidth it's seen, and it says, I did 200 kilobytes over the past, uh, per second, 
uh, burst over the past day, so I'm going to advertise 200 kilobytes. And then somebody else advertises 20 kilobytes, and the larger guy gets more weight when you're choosing the path, which again is maybe bad for security, but it's really good for having it work. Cool, thank you. I have a question regarding, uh, it's a practical usage actually. Hello, I'm here. <laughs> okay. Um, I'm running a tour, uh, server at home and uh, recent weeks I read a lot about the like European, East European countries, uh, the police departments doing attacks for like uh, child porn, against child pornography. So people who also uh, are running uh, the tour servers also get somehow affected with that. Uh, did you have uh, something like that? I mean, did you get some information like that, that some people who run the servers got problems with the child por pornography, mostly? So I have two answers for that. Uh, one answer is it's really pretty much only Germany where the police are stealing Tor servers. Uh, it's not happening in the U.S. and other countries. Uh, so I guess the, the war is on here a little bit faster than it is in other countries to try to explain to law enforcement that actually security on the internet is worthwhile to have. Uh, that's the first answer. And the second answer is there are some nice people in the CCC who are coordinating the, uh, the discussion about that. And some of them are sitting in the front row here. So you should chat with your CCC friends and uh, ask them details about the current legal and political and social uh, issues in Germany. Uh, I'd love to help out where I can, but it makes a lot more sense for the people in Germany to be leading that than for me to be leading that. Um, last questions? Uh, yes. Um, there's, uh, if the police comes and gets your server, um, there's still the problem if you're running a, a hidden service inside of Tor, uh, it's usually unencrypted on your hard disk, you just run a web server, there's no um, such kind of support that it's only accessible uh, via Tor and not from the local hard disk, you have to care about all the encryption yourself, it's really hard to set up a secure hidden service. So that one answer would be local encryption and so on, but I agree that's a bad answer. Uh, a better answer would be don't run your hidden service on the same place as your Tor server. You can run your hidden service anyway, anywhere. Hidden services, as long as you can get to the Tor network, people can get back to you. So you can run your hidden service deep inside the corporate firewall right next to the finance computer or something, and nobody would ever think to go to that one to, to try to collect it. So what you described is maybe a great answer for why you shouldn't run a hidden service on the same computer as a Tor exit note. Last, Jake's got one. Yep. So, um, assuming that every person in this room starts a server, I just saw someone start one right now, for example, um, and they're all going to be on a public IP address here at the conference. How will you stop um, people from just routing around inside the conference? I mean, you usually have the My Family option when you're adding like I run a couple servers and they're all in the same family so you're not going to select them when you're selecting your path. How do you stop that from happening and still make it user friendly? So there are two answers to that. The, the big question is uh, what if everybody here runs a Tor server, won't many of the Tor users around the world just be routing from that laptop to that laptop to that laptop and then out uh, and wouldn't that be bad for security? So the easy answer is uh, every Tor server has an IP address that it publicizes and Tor looks at the slash 16 and says, these are on the same network. I don't think I want to use both of them in the same circuit. Uh, so assuming we don't have a slash 8 here, I haven't looked at what sort of network uh, uh, IP address bandwidth we've got. Uh, but assuming we don't have a, a whole lot of addresses here, that's, that's automatically taken care of by Tor. Because Tor, the, the Tor client will look and say, there are 1,200 servers and 400 of them are on the same network. Um, that's great. I'm going to choose probably one of those, but I'm not going to choose more than one of them for my circuit. And that means that, yeah, somebody here might be able to learn that Alice is using Tor, 
and maybe in another case somebody might learn that somebody's connecting to Bob, but there isn't going to be any circuit over Tor that uses uh, two or three of these laptops in the same circuit. So that's, that's one answer and I think it applies here. Uh, the other answer that you described is that uh, as a Tor server you can manually say uh, I'm controlling this one in Venezuela and this one in California and this one in Germany so you shouldn't use them in the same circuit because it's really I'm the, I'm the guy who's, using, who's running all of them. Um, and that is hard to do, it's manual, it's not very automated. Uh, but did that, did that answer that? The easy answer is by IP address. Um, if I got you right, you're trying to um, change the traffic so that um, traffic can't be um, connected to the Tor network so easily, so that you can't have automatic routines seeing this as Tor traffic you block it. But if I've got a person, like a dissident in China, where I think, hey, this guy might be using Tor, and then I watch him, and I directly couldn't, I mean, the government might have all kinds of possibilities watching his IP traffic. And they see some kind of, okay, there's some SSL connection going on, so they can check the server on the other side, they can find out it's a Tor, Tor server, it's possibly the bridge this person is using, so they can start blocking that one, so the person will use the next one, yep. so they will start blocking that one. So, so there was a slide that I took out right before I came up here, because I didn't have enough time for all of them, on scanning resistance. Uh, this would be a property where even if the adversary wants to look at the whole internet and say, where are all the bridges, I'll block them preemptively, uh, it's hard to tell if it's a bridge just by connecting to it. Um, and this is a, a neat property, but it's kind of hard to get. Uh, one of the ways we could get it is we have to give some sort of extra secret to the Tor user when we tell them the bridge address. We say, here is the IP and port for the bridge, and here's the secret that will let it actually act like a bridge. Otherwise, it's going to say, uh, welcome to Apache default. Uh, this is a web server that hasn't been configured yet, uh, or something like that. Um, that's maybe interesting, but maybe China should then go block everything that's an unconfigured Apache server, because who needs to connect to those? Uh, so there's an arms race there that we need to think harder about. Uh, we could also imagine some sort of neat port knocking scheme where you connect with the right secret and then it becomes a, a connection and otherwise it just hangs up on you and there's, there's nothing here at all. Uh, probably port knocking is the wrong answer because then we have to have uh, root or something like that so we can send weird packets and weird packets stand out. Uh, so good question. I don't know a good answer but uh, I'd like to have some property like that too. Um, the other answer, the, the higher level answer, is if the Chinese are watching you that carefully, I'm very sorry, I can't help you. Last chance? Okay, thank you. I'll be around to answer more questions. <laughs>